What is going on guys? This is Oliver, formerly from Response AI and a few other software tools and now running a few new software tools and rosewell.dev. I'm really excited about this video because um, I'm going to be going through the full sort of vibe coding setup for me going into 2026 and um, I suppose a bit of a prerequisite here is that I am exploring Claude code and I'll be doing some videos on Claude code um, in the next couple of days and weeks um, because it's really powerful. I don't use it right now so I would never do like a video explaining how to use it or how to get the most out of it if I'm not sort of mastering it myself. So what's happening right now? People who may not write code from scratch but who understand systems architecture, they can talk, they can direct, they can ship production quality software really quickly, right? And this video distills how you can do that um, and how you can get the most out of it and how I'm doing it, right? So this video it explains my complete model for working with AI coding agents, my vibe coding stack explained, mastering cursor 2.0, um, advanced techniques for maintaining code quality, designing UIs literally from paper sketches, and then how to design UIs um, with voice flow, so just talking, and then a walkthrough of models and building your first app, right? So vibe coding is a term that a guy on X uh, or Twitter called Andrej Karpathy, very important guy in AI. He made this up to explain how um, software is being made with AI assisted, you know, workflows, right? So this is where the developer relies primarily on speaking and giving uh, AI agents instructions on writing code rather than doing it manually. So a bit of key terminology, an AI coding agent is a system that can autonomously write, modify and execute code, right? So you've got Claude code, Cursor, GitHub Copilot, Windsurf, Droid, that kind of thing, right? Um, now, context window, the amount of information an AI can remember in a conversation, okay? So that's measured in tokens, and that's why things can either be expensive or cheap. So modern models, uh, like Claude Opus 4.5, etc., they can handle sort of a lot of context window. Codex is like 275,000. It's a lot, right? And spec mode is a planning phase where you work with the AI to create detailed specifications before you ask it to write any code at all. So... My vibe coding stack that I'm using in 2026, Cursor. So Cursor's um, an AI-first code editor, right? And it's built on VS Code. You don't have to worry about that too much, but VS Code existed long before AI and people were just using it to write manual code. And I got used to that. So then when Cursor came out, I was like, okay, I'll use this, right? Now, the code base wide context means, I know that's a lot of words, but it just means that when you ask it a question, it understands your, you know, a lot of your code base, which is really good. There's a terminal integration, so you can connect to GitHub really easily and launch your software easily. And there's also support for cursor rules, right, which we'll go into shortly. Now, Superbase for the back end, right? So I get users to log in and log out with Superbase. I save their subscriptions so I know if they're in a free trial or if they're paying. Um, I store all their data, like their images or their posts or their nicknames, anything, right, in the back end. And then I use edge functions. So say if I want to ask ChatGPT to write me, um, you know, a tweet or ChatGPT to um, analyze a wall of text, right? I will ask an edge function, which is just like a quick job. I will ask Superbase um, and its edge functions to do that for me, like call ChatGPT or ask, um, you know, an API, like say if I want to um, get the current weather, you create an edge function to fetch the weather from that API, right? So why Superbase for non-technical builders? Well, it's generously free, right? It's really AI friendly and has built-in row-level security. In other words, if two users log in, guys, and they have very um, private information, like say they have a to-do list, user one can never see user two's to-do list. It's very, very, you know, obviously important security um, to allow people privacy in their app. So that's what row level security is on a very, very, very simplified uh, sort of like uh, threshold, right? Now, GitHub version control. So GitHub is almost like save game, right? So you've made loads of progress on Skyrim or whatever, um, and you click save game. In the same sense, um, you know, GitHub stores the code, tracks the changes, and enables collaboration. And from Cursor, you just say, push this to GitHub, and it will save all of your code to GitHub, right? As you can see on the right, I have hundreds of files in one of my GitHub projects. I have something like 30 GitHub projects. 
and the essential concepts here, guys. So repository is a repo, which is your project folder, which is tracked and it has all your code in it. A commit is a snapshot of your code at a point in time. So if I say I want to commit now, it will snapshot how my code looks and save the game, in other words. And a branch is a parallel version of your code for testing features, right? Um, it's like a test branch. Now, Vercel is what I use for deployment at the moment. I also use Netlify, which is pretty good, but Vercel specializes in that front end with no configuration. And all you have to do is ask Cursor, help me launch to Vercel. And it takes about five minutes to do it, right? Automatic deployments from GitHub. So every time I push to GitHub, it deploys on Vercel. And it just makes sense, guys. It's really easy to use. Now, what you're going to do is create an account for Cursor, GitHub, Superbase, and Vercel if you haven't. And ideally, you would buy a domain, right? Because you can use Vercel's custom domains or whatever it may be. Um, but I would recommend using Vercel, right? Um, Vercel with a custom domain, like buy it from Porkbun for really cheap. Now, mastering Cursor. So you can use, you can obviously ask Cursor questions. You can just say, can you do this for me, right? Now that is good, but you can use markdown files, in other words, .md files in Cursor as brains on disk, right? That tell the AI how to help you. Um, so you can rely less on being technical and rely less on the AI knowing information out of thin air and more on clear written vibes and examples. So this is similar to a PRD, which I always talk about on the channel which is where you describe, I'll talk about that again later, you describe what you want and then you create a product um, requirements document uh, and then give it to AI so it'll, throughout your development process, it'll know what you're talking about. So what markdown files are useful for? So project instructions, it's a living how this project works and what I want, like almost like an instructions.md. That the cursor can read whenever you ask it to make code, right? So style patterns, you've got simple style guides like I only want to use this font or I always use this spacing or always use these colors, right? In my current app that I'm building, I have a very sort of like plain terracotta orangey vibe. It's like, um, it's like, it's almost like that color, right? Like orangey. And basically from that perspective, my instructions say always use these colors and always use these fonts. So in the end, my app will always look the same instead of it being this vibe coded mess, right? Now for bigger features, you can let Cursor create or update a plan with the plan mode. And then you can create the to-do list and the file references within that and then execute it step by step, which is absolutely insane. You create a small instructions file. So you add a new file like um, Cursor Notes. Write in plain language, like use TypeScript, keep functions short, explain your changes. I like doing Eli5, so E-L-I-5. In other words, it says, look, um, once you've done all these things, can you explain like I'm five what you've done? You can also go back, going back, you can also go to cursor.directory and you'll see all of the really extensive um, cursor rules files that you can just copy paste into your file into your files right and you point cursor at it with an at and in the chat type something like use the guidelines in these rules for all future changes now plan and build x or y cursor you will, will use that file as context you don't have to repeat your preferences every time now as you can see on the right part three is the workflow so from being in the shower to literally shipping software so Phase one is the brain dump. I don't code at all on phase one. I use the basic iOS dictation tool on my MacBook to record a stream of consciousness rant about what I want to build. My prompts to myself. So, okay, walking through the user flow, the user lands on the homepage. It's dark mode, cyberpunk, it's beautiful. It's like crypto-y, it's really cool. And they see a big input box and it's, you know, they, 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 they want to click on a stock ticker and they want to see the you know the stock prices of apple and that kind of thing right so what am i going to use am i going to use an api from appify am i going to use one of the old yahoo finance apis that don't exist anymore whatever it may be now the output that was all messy guys the output is a messy 1000 word text block and i'm just doing this while driving or you know while on a walk whatever it may be the distillation i go to gemini and I paste it with the instructions, turn this ramble into a structured PRD, a feature list and a user flow diagram. Now, the other thing that I often do 
um, and it's something new. I either use Dribble, so I go to Dribble um, with three Bs, Dribble.com, and I just take pictures of UI that I love. But sometimes Cursor and sometimes all of these different um, AIs, they don't know how, like, they don't really know exactly what you want it to look like, right? It's the best way that I do it is I draw it, right? I will draw either in Canva online or on a sketchbook online or whatever, or I'll draw on paper. In front of my computer, I will airdrop a picture of the, you know, drawn piece of paper to um, my computer and then send it to cursor, right? You draw a little box on a piece of paper or a title, etc., and you can, you know, divide it into sections. And if you don't want to do that, you literally go to Dribble or Pinterest and you look up SAS dashboard or, you know, modern software website, whatever it may be. Now, the context upload is these images are all saved and I will feed up to like 10 pictures to the AI to make that plan, right? And I'll typically um, give all the photos to the AI, then I will ask it to plan the UI and the design. Now, the phase three is the most important part for me, the ask user interview, right? So from there, before a single line of code is written, I force the AI to interview me, right? This aligns our mental models. So the prompt is review the PRD that we got from Gemini earlier and act as a senior engineering manager. Before we start coding, ask me five to 10 clarifying questions about design preferences, cases of you know bugs or logic gaps, whatever it may be. Do not generate the code until I answer these and make sure it's in plan mode. Now, context packing, right? So context and models. I create a folder called slash docs um, or inside cursor, you can actually just upload docs to the, the docs, you know, sort of like window inside settings. I download the documentation from all the things I'm using for the specific tools. So the other day I needed to understand Gemini's documentation for Gemini Flash 2.5, right? It's just a really fast um, API to like make, you know, um, tweets or posts or Reddit posts or blog posts, whatever it may be. I just copy pasted the entire documentation. I put it into the docs. And as you can see in the bottom right, you just type at and then you say, look, this is my current goal. Build the user settings page. And I pin the file or the docs with Composer. And this keeps the AI focused on the immediate task, right? Prevents it from hallucinating, that kind of thing. The most important example is, Recently, I said, look, I want to be able to write a blog post um, based on my loose notes. Um, I'm going to post the documentation for Gemini, and I want you to create me a function to call Gemini and build a blog post based on my notes, right? It would take the notes from the front end that I've just sort of like scrappily put in um, by typing, and it'll send that data to Gemini. Gemini responds with a full 2000 word blog post and all that was done um, in the span of say 10 seconds and I, it's because I tagged the cursor rule uh, or the cursor documentation to follow the Gemini documentation, right? So basically you've got to just pack all the context you need into prompts by using the at sign and then choosing from the docs. Now, model selection, right? I switch models, guys, based on the tasks. So planning, architecture, cursor composer, always, right? If I want to be interviewed by the AI or I want to create a very long, um, you know, intensive plan, I will use composer because it has an immense, you know, context window. It has an immense sort of brain for that kind of thing. Now, if I'm being lazy, and I just want the features that it's uh, planned to be totally one-shotted, I would use Codex or Opus 4.5, right? Opus is very expensive, guys. So sometimes on Cursor, I'll do a full plan and I will execute it with Opus. And it sometimes costs like $3, right? Which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is if you're prompting it, you know, two or three times a day, every day, right? It, like like it, it ends up being hundreds of dollars a month. So to maintain your pricing, if you want to just stay on the $20 plan, make sure obviously that you are planning with Cursor Composer and then trying to one shot with cheaper uh, sort of like models. You can one shot things with Composer, but it won't be as good. Codex is cheaper than Opus. I'm pretty good, but Opus is just mega expensive, right? But it's the king currently. Now, refactoring 
and you know sort of like solving complex bugs i use codex right it is slower and more expensive but it thinks deeper about systemic issues and then tiny changes to ui either composer or gemini fast now to sort of like wrap this part up like what do i think about strategic recommendations for actually building software right so you've got to maintain scope controls the idea parking lot so ai is fast right but it distracts you You'll see a feature that you want and you'll want to add it and it's all exciting and you don't, you shouldn't, right? You create a file called backlog.md or you use a to-do list app. I literally use the app Todoist and it's just free and I just post loads of my stuff in there. I think of something, oh, I need to do that. When you have a cool idea, tell the AI, add dark mode to the, to the backlog.md, right? Do not implement it for now. You focus on the main quest, you focus on the main thing that we're planning and executing and on top of that, then don't let the AI build one giant file with 3000 lines, right? Because it'll start getting confused. Like my landing page for one of my projects um, a couple of months ago was like 3000 lines, 4000 lines. If I even ask it to change the color of the hero section or a color of a button on there, it just loses the plot and blows up because it's like you're asking me to search for an entire search, an entire file with the thousands of lines for one button, right? So if a file hits 200 odd lines, I typically tell the AI, look, refactor this and break the user card component or the landing page component, or whatever, into its own file. Small files is smarter AI because it'll be able to use the context better. Now, once a feature works, I ask the AI to critique itself and I ask for a ELI5, an ELI5. You just built the payment flow. It works, right? I've been able to sign up and pay. Now review the code you just wrote. Are there security vulnerabilities? Is there a cleaner way to write this? Refactor for safety. Can we add more logs? And explain, like I'm five years old, how this works. And crucially, guys, you can ask it for edge cases, which is when you basically ask the... Um, I just realized there's no image on this slide. I think it's because I didn't know this slide existed um, because I thought I deleted it earlier on because it wouldn't load. So you can ask the AI... Explain like I'm five, all of the problems that could arise from edge cases. And edge cases are basically all of these thousands of different possibilities. So possibilities that someone could try and log in and their card declines. It's like, well, do you let them in? What happens if their card declines? What happens if their card doesn't decline, but then they get in and, you know, it says that they haven't paid. So they have paid, but the app says they have. Like you have to find all the edge cases and ask AI, to manage these and explain to you what will happen. So just to sort of summarize, right, let's sort of go through this. So you've got the key points, the vibe coding stack, which is Cursor, Superbase, GitHub, and Vercel. Create accounts for all of these different ones. So Cursor, GitHub, Superbase, Vercel. And then for mastering Cursor, the best thing I can give you guys is to create or just copy paste from Cursor's directory these um, sort of PD, uh, md files that you put inside cursor and then it follows the instructions from there then every time you want to execute something big you use at and you tag the important file then from there the cursor workflow for me is i create the small instructions file and the um, prd and then every time i want to execute something i will point cursor at it with the at sign to start the PRD at all, when I'm first thinking about building an app, I will use a brain dump while driving or while at the gym or whatever, and then I'll pop it into Gemini. And then from there, if you want to sketch or just steal photos from Dribble, um, you know, that's just the way it is. Like they're not going to steal the design, you know, line for line, but they are, the AI is going to, you know, sort of like use it as inspiration. From there, then I interview myself. Um, as I go along and then I plan with Cursor Composer, execute with Opus or Codex, bug, maintain with Codex, and then obviously I keep a backlog file for all of my ideas. Now guys, obviously any problems at all, any ideas you have, let me know, any questions, give me a shout, but I'll see you guys in the next one and take care.